if you want to be the Michael Jordan of cold email or sales, you're going to have to wake up every morning, send 800 hoops, and then next day and so on and so on, and keep at it for the long term. Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy from the of QuickMail.io. Hey, and this is Jack from emailsthatsell.com. This episode, Jack and I are going through the nine golden rules of cold email. Could be 10, but I only came up with four. Think of those rules as the constant background noise that plays in our head when we sit down launching a new cold email campaign. This episode will be packed with actionable golden nuggets. In fact, if you're new to cold email, this is probably right there, a 500 bucks, three weeks course packed in under 30 minutes. And if not, you'll definitely enjoy listening to all of our real life examples. Enjoy. All right, golden rules. These are some of the sayings or adages or just thoughts that go around my brain when I'm writing cold emails and just thinking about cold email in general. I told Jeremy about this idea and, it, and he had some golden rules of his own and I haven't heard him yet, but we're going to share them on this cast. Jeremy, how about I kick things off with my first golden rule? Yeah, let's go for it. It should be an interesting episode. Yeah. Okay. So first one is a phrase we've said multiple times on the cast. My first golden rule of cold email is build a bridge. So for those of you who haven't heard episodes where we talk about similarity or liking, building a bridge is connecting you and your prospect. So anytime you can make the relationship closer than a one stranger talking to another, your reply rates are going to improve. So for example, Jeremy, I could reach out to you even if I didn't know anything about you personally. I could say, hey, Jeremy, we're both into building sales tools. Boom. That's it. That's a bridge. It's not very elegant, but at least there's some level playing field in effect. Yeah, this one is a sketchy bridge, but um, I'm sure you can find (laughs) more solid and the foundation to build on. But, you know, Jack is exactly right. The name of the game here is to find everything that takes you closer to your prospect. The idea of being in their tribe, you know, we reply to people in your tribe that share a lot of things with you way more than people that are completely stranger, don't share your values, and, you know, you don't really see the benefit in connecting. Especially with what we keep on saying, which is, the goal of cold email is to open a conversation. You don't start a conversation with people that, you know, don't talk to strangers. You hear that so many times. So, you know, build bridges. Jeremy, you have probably the best example of building a bridge in a cold email that I've heard. It had to do with the video game developer who reached out to you a while back. Can you talk us through that a little bit, just the basics? Yeah, so it was uh, a few years ago when I, actually, today, that's been five years I've been starting QuickMail. So it's, um, yeah, Yeah. super cool stuff for me. So full time for five years. And at that time, I was pretty much looking at every campaign, helping every user on board and stuff like that. And it was a campaign that crushed it. And I looked at how that person was tackling their campaign. And it was about a student in video games who was reaching out to video games veterans. And basically, you know, those veterans were receiving an email from someone who is, you know, sort of like following their footsteps. So it's like, oh, that guy is in my tribe, he's in this uh, school for doing video games. I am doing video games and he asked for one or two tips on advice. Sure, I would have benefited from that myself, so I'm going to go ahead and then reply. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's about as textbook definition as I can think of when it comes to building a bridge. Jeremy, what is first on your cold email golden rule list? Oh gosh, I'm terrible with the prioritization of those sort of things. What's the first one you wrote down? Oh, the first one that I wrote down, okay, I'll go with this one. It's uh, you catch more f- flies with honey or something around those things. Yes. Which is basically, you know, the fox and a crow. The thing we keep on saying is that, you know, just don't go with trying to attack or an angle that put people in a bad spot. You know, no one will want to reply to that. Instead, you know, just try to see what positive thing there is in that conversation or in, in the prospect, basically, and then help them put some light on that No, but you're saying it's far more effective to 
highlight what they could achieve than it is to focus on what they're doing poorly. Yeah, no, 100%. So like the example that I keep on in my head is obviously when I was trying to reach out to financial planners and had like two different tactics. Or one day I was trying like, hey, you know, their website is so rubbish. Let me just like show them or point to them that their website is rubbish and I can help them making it better. Totally flopped, got insults and stuff like that. So (laughs) let's learn here. And since that day, you know, I remember like always try to come from the positive side rather than negative side. So instead, I will compliment on other things. If you can always find, you know, things that people do well or, you know, congrats on your number of followers or whatever kind of thing. And then you say, hey, you may actually be able to get more of X, Y, Z if we help you maybe working on your website or some stuff like that. That's great. Yeah, much better. And I think this is doubly important if you're going after people who are employees within a company, because 100%. if you share an email with them about something they're responsible for that is currently bad, then in their best interest to delete and burn that message so nobody <laughs> else sees it. I mean, think about it. You want to be writing an email that is going to make them shine if they forward it on to their boss. That's right. So don't say something like, Hey, I see your website is horrible. You say that to the webmaster and you also CC his boss, you know. (laughs) Right, right. I I actually... I haven't tried this campaign. may work. (laughs) I don't think it would. But I actually, a week and a half ago, got an email that said, Hey, I've been enjoying the cast. But when I checked out your website, the copyright date was off. There's a few other things I found. Should I share them with you? And just, I think they did a good job of gently bringing to my attention that I needed to fix it with sprinkling in a compliment there. So they were definitely using the catching more flies with honey saying here. Actually, I think we all got the notion here, but I'm still going to drop another example, a recent example, because I think it was just beautiful. A few days ago, one person reached out to us on our live chat website and starting by criticizing all the mistakes, spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes that was made on the website. Okay. And so, you know, all I care about is like my software runs well and my people are getting results. Not that, you know, they can read or or anyway. (laughs) So I don't really care about that. But, you know, I just told him like, hey, sure, you know, I'm going to forward that to the marketing person that is looking into that. And uh, yeah, is there anything else I can help you with? And then that person carried on and say, yeah, I got a business that helps uh, non-native speakers to actually got their website in shape and stuff like that. Ah, uh, wow. Not to mention, first of all, that we got 50% US people in my company. But anyway, <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. And as soon as I got that, I was like, yeah, right. No, nah, I don't want, you know, it's just like, nah, you know, it, it just rubbed me the wrong way. And I told him it's not a priority and he kept on insisting on this. So it's just like, uh, nah, not the right angle, definitely. Jack, what could that person have done in order to make it work? I thought you were going to explain what they could have done to get you to respond, which I would have been very interested in because you're a tough one to get a reply from. But I did respond. You did respond. But it was like a live chat and I was like fooled because I thought it was like a genuine user. Right. right? Fair enough. So, okay. One thing, I don't know, just be very clear up front and the initial outreach, like, hey, my software found a couple spelling mistakes. I just sent them to your support team. And here are a couple other ones. By the way, this software scans websites for spelling errors. You're welcome to try it out if that catches your interest. I don't know, something where you're not using this as a sneaky tactic to open the door. I think he used the mouse and whisker in this case. But if I were him, I would probably have gone with like, hey, noticed quite a few, you know, spelling mistakes. Actually, that's that's probably not the right approach. Right. But, I wouldn't do that. But no, I wouldn't do that either. But the point would have been more about asking me if this is a priority for my business at some point to, cool. to get some wording that will help maybe yeah. to convert more. So bringing this full circle, they could have complimented QuickMail's user base and then mentioned their tool found a couple of spelling issues. Is it a priority for you to keep your website updated with proper English? You know, that's funny. We're kind of like 
merging with another cast. But I think we should carry on because there is gold here. I think what they could have done is saying like, hey, congrats on building such great business, you know, in five years. Yeah. I yeah. personally noticed that some spending mistake can turn away some big customers. Is that a priority for you this year to actually make sure that all your wording on your website is, you know, is spot on? That's brilliant. And so I think I think that's nice. That's coming from a genuine, nice, complimentary, you know, way. Yeah. And providing value and asking me, you know, respectfully if you know this is a priority for me or not. And this is what I will miss on if I don't take action, which is potentially missing higher you know, bigger enterprise type of uh, customers. That's true. Sounds fair enough? Yeah, it does sound fair enough. Yeah, so, <laughs> all right, we'll keep moving. But the key difference there was the approach was straightforward. They didn't beat around the bush. And they also positioned it so that they just found out if it was important to you or not. That's funny. We're not going to come back probably to this example because some of my golden rules are actually applied here. Let's carry on then. All right. But my let's hear your ones. Yeah, my second golden rule of cold email, dangle a carrot. <laughs> dangle a carrot. So think you're, you know, you got an ox and you want it to go somewhere. I, I want to bring two things out from this golden rule, this seemingly very simple golden rule. Number one, you're dangling a carrot as opposed to beating them with a stick, right? Like you're not pressuring this donkey or ox to move forward. You're presenting them with a clear benefit that they are wanting to reach for. So this has to do with making sure your copy obviously has benefits, not features. And second, you're dangling a carrot, a single carrot in front of this ox, not many different kinds of vegetables that you think they'll go after. Keep it. <laughs> go and pick up, you know, on the right, you got the yeah. salad. On the left, you got the cucumber. <laughs> In the middle, <laughs> you the got the Yeah. <laughs> so keep it focused on a single carrot, on a single benefit in each email. And if you're worried about not having enough time to say everything, that's what the follow-ups are for. So my second golden rule, dangle a carrot. Uh, that's awesome. I'm imagining uh, applying that typically for, you know, bad cold email, they will have like carrots <laughs> all around <laughs> the ox and that stuff wouldn't move. But the follow up is a great analogy too. It's like, first you got the carrots, he goes there, eats it, and then, oh, there's a new one or something else. Or if the carrot doesn't work, you switch it to something else. And Brilliant. That's... Chocolate cake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're up. Oh, hold on. Um, I wanted to say something else. I want to come back to quickly to something like super powerful that you sort of went very quickly over. It's the difference between benefit and feature. And I want to give a couple of examples. Maybe you have some too that you can give. Let's say, for example, that you have 256 bits encryption for XYZ, right? Instead of saying like, hey, we got 256 bit encryptions, which, you know, is a feature, you will actually turn it into a benefit, like no one will be able to hack your account or you will never be attacked by, you know, a scammer or whatever. Never give away your key for other people to use, well, whatever. That's one thing. Another example, and then after that, you can go ahead with two examples on your own. Let's say, for example, this is waterproof. I got a product, it's waterproof. That's a feature, waterproof. But what it really means is like, hey, I can use it while I'm showering, so I never actually need to remember to remove it or to remove that wearable object. So I can just live without having to think about it. Those sort of thing. If this is a tracker, for example. All right. So let's say I have a landing page software that I'm pushing. So one of the features, the visual editor, like kind of a drag and drop. Okay. It's a feature. The benefit is you don't have to go out and hire a developer to put this landing page together. In other words, by this afternoon, your landing page can be ready to go. Or you will save time. There you go. Pictures. You wouldn't need to send an example. You can just watch straight away what it does. Yeah. How it looks like. Or maybe a feature would be a certain average opt-in rate or conversion rate. But the end benefit is you will be able to hit your sales goals with the same amount of traffic that you're already getting. All right. Move on. What do you got? Um, let me see. I will come back to the first one I was thinking of in terms of chronological order. Just know your audience. Simple as that. And this comes down to sending the right type of messages to the right type of people. Like you mentioned often, give me a hungry crowd or something like that. And, you know, I'll sell lots of hamburgers, something around like that. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. The only advantage I want. Oh, yeah. If given a choice is a starving crowd. This is Gary Halpert's 
answer to which advantage would you like if you could pick any hamburger stand advantage, which one would you want in order to crush the competition? A starving crowd. Brilliant. So cool. Okay, so in other words, know your audience is the golden rule that you are thinking of in terms of find your starving crowd, essentially. It's more like whenever I'm writing a message, I have to think of my audience first, right? So if I'm going to contact, I don't know, VP of sales, I wouldn't actually do the same discussion that I would have if I'm talking to a founder, which wouldn't be the same if I'm talking to a marketing person. That's brilliant. You have to adapt your messaging to the people that will receive your message. Otherwise, you're just broadcasting and with little effect. So in other words, this is more of a copywriting golden rule than it is a list building golden rule. Know your audience so you know how to write for them. So you know how to get them to reply. So you know what they care about. Yeah, I think they go hand in hand in a sense that I need to know who I want to talk to. And then after that, I can go and build this list as well. That's fine. But I think it's the core is like, who do you want to talk to? And then after that, you build it and then you talk into a certain way. Okay, uh, I've got a couple more here. So my next cold email golden rule, hold the door open. Hold on, hold on. What the heck do I mean by that? <laughs> so I want to make it extremely easy to take the next step. You want your prospect to walk from the outside into your warehouse or into your storefront or into your office. The more we can hold the door open for them or the easier we can make that first step, the better. So this is all about your call to action. So you want to hold the door open and just get them to take the first step. Make it extremely easy to respond as opposed to asking them for credit card details, which is just about the hardest thing you can ask somebody. And if you keep hold the door open in mind as you're crafting your CTAs, my bet is your response rates are going to go up because you're making it easy for the prospect. Easy is good. My next one would be what's in it for them. Love it. And it's super easy to think about like, oh yeah, they're going to love my software, you know, or they're going to love my product or whatever. But one thing that I keep in mind is like I'm writing for them is that would I be happy to be in their shoes and receive 10 times this email? Because one time you can kind of think like, oh yeah, I would love to receive this email. But if you receive it 10 times this email, will my excitement actually go up because I received like 10 times this offer? Yeah. Or would I actually start, you know, getting pissed off? Because you can probably <laughs> imagine that you start getting annoyed by receiving like 10 times this email, right? It's probably not enough benefits, right? For the person who receives it. Interesting. So am I getting this right? Is one of your filters to determine if the message is up to the quality standards, you ask yourself, if I sent my prospects this message 10 times, would they still like to receive it? Almost. I put myself in their shoes and I say, I received the message I just sent 10 times. Will I be 10 times happier? Will I be equally happier? Or will I be more and more annoyed? I can't think of a single thing that I'd be more happy on the 10th time than well, on I, the I first time. Well, I tell you, time. like, for example, if I, you know, if you get like a free trial of one month, okay. I'd be happy to get like 10 months for free. Oh, I see. So you're like 10 times in the offer, not yeah. saying the same reminder nine times. Well, you know, imagine it could come from other people. Yes, that's, that's what I mean. It's like, imagine 10 other people offering the same sort of service or product cool, sending you cool, the email cool. and I receive like 10 times. Would I get excited to get 10 of those or would I get actually more annoyed, right? Right. It's a simple rule because one is usually something we can kind of like give a pass, but the prospect will never give you a pass. So it's like, oh, sure, I would love to, you know, test this stuff. But then would I love to test 10 different stuff? Maybe not. So, you know, what can I make it to actually make it more appealing? Like I would go and test those 10 stuff because I got X or Y. And that's what makes me. 10 times the amount. Yes, that's what makes me want to try 10 times that stuff. So this is dovetailing nicely with one of my golden rules. I'll say it so we can bring it into the conversation. My next golden rule, make someone's day. Use cold email to make someone's day. If you do that, you're very much on the right track here. And... To me, this is sort of another way of saying you want this email to have so much value or wow or just come out of nowhere that they're really excited about it. Love it. Pretty much. How do you actually make sure that 
you make someone's day? Or can you give some examples? It's very simple. So would it make my day if somebody invited me to a demo of a product that I don't even know I need yet? Absolutely not. I'm nowhere near there. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I'm not Damn. interested in current products, but until you get me to that point where I realize that, hey, maybe there's something here that I'm missing out on, it's not going to make my day for a Calendly link invite. I'm not there. However, let's take QuickMail, for example. So one way you could say, hey, Jack, you're due outbound. Do you want a trial? If I'm already satisfied there, the trial's not going to do anything for me. However, if this is the first time I'm exposed to automated sales emails, you might say, hey, Jack, if you'd like to take uh, try this out, why don't you send me 100 prospects? I'll run them through the software for you so your team doesn't have to follow up on each one manually. Okay, this is something that if you offer that 10 times the amount, life is pretty good. This is cool stuff. Yep, that's cool. And what's interesting is they're both a trial. They're both a trial. Just in one case, you're taking all the work out, all of the friction out of the equation, and it's just goods for Jack. This is the value that I think we're talking about here. Can you find another example of making someone's day? Yeah, so some people use my agency to do prospecting. So they'll say, Jack, you know, we're looking for this kind of company. Get really specific, hopefully, and we go and find them. Now, in order to promote this service, I could use cold email and say, hey, do you need a guy who can do prospecting for you? But that's not the kind of 10 times you get that message, your day's not better. However, if I said, Jeremy, from what I see on QuickMail, it looks like you're going after, I don't know, Fortune 1000 companies and specifically their VP of sales. Do you want me to just go and drum up 20 of these prospects for you? If you like them, you know where they're coming from. If you don't, then you got 20 prospects. No big deal either way. Love it. So you're going to send me some, you know, some 10 times those emails, right? <laughs> that one I have to be careful with because I actually have to go and do the prospecting. So you're a bad fit for that one right now. <laughs> you got your fingers burnt, right? With this uh, story. No, no. I mean, long story short, I basically offered way more than that in uh, my first cold email campaign. It worked, but... God, there were some tire kickers who uh, <laughs> wasted. Yeah, great response rates. Yeah. So um, that said, if, if you are hunting for very, very good prospects and you've got more than just the boring job title, industry, and company size, if that's all you have, then there's databases out there. Go have fun. But if you want to get really granular, send me a message. Cool. Or just go to my website. Okay, you've got another one. Yeah, I think that will be my last golden rule for today. It's uh, something I keep on saying, especially when we're talking about follow-ups, is uh, positive persistence. And what I mean by that is that not necessarily, you know, that, hey, did you get my message kind of thing? I just wanted to follow up, making sure that I'm on top of your inbox, you know, me, me, me kind of thing. Yeah. But it's more about like, circling back maybe in three months and say, hey, just notice that you guys got a round of funding. Is now a good time for doing cold email or exploring growth through outbounds or, you know, those sort of thing that will actually just potentially bring some value or saying like, hey, just notice that, you know, you also got a, like a strong inbound stuff. Just wanted to let you know that, you know, QuickMail can also do inbound as well as outbounds. Have you considered the benefits of, you know, having one product? doing both of them uh, instead of paying, you know, HubSpot plus something else or Marketo or whatever. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think those sort of thing, it's something that is, if done well and not like annoyingly, I think that can build trust and start a genuine conversation with someone and say, you know, usually they come back and say, well, that's nice. We don't need it right now, but just stay in touch or maybe someone else may need it. Now that I hear you explain why positive persistence is your last golden rule. Do you think you could substitute that with timing is everything? Not quite. I don't believe that too much because for me, it's more about building relationship more than doing transactional relationship, transactional communication. A lot of people, they're like, you know, those shavers, you use it once, you throw it to the trash bin. Disposable, right? You know? Yeah, it's a disposable kind of like use it once. Yeah. And with the positive persistence, you're actually just staying on top of your prospects and you're building trust. Because, you know, I know this person he keeps on emailing me some interesting things, thoughtful things. At some point, you know, I will trust to have a relationship with this person. And it's not just one of those 
person that will just, you know, use a relationship as a disposable kind of thing. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not into those shady tactics and all that jazz, but I think you've nailed it because it's this conversation that begins that, you know, even if it ends temporarily with, hey, circle back, I'm not ready for this now. Like you said, there's the winners know that there's the deal on the horizon. If you're just willing to work the leads, I would imagine most of the sales do come in at like the back end stuff, you know, where if it doesn't happen right away, it's staying on top, it's nurturing those leads that really tend to pay off. Yeah, I think those are long term strategies. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not not here saying that that's where most of sales come in. Maybe I should revise it. But certainly there's a chunk of sales that do come in that are often ignored. Yeah, there is a tendency of thinking that for me, it's like any skill. You have to practice to get good at it. People who use this relationship as a disposable thing, it's like it's the same people you will find just, you know, doing baseball for five weeks and moving on to basketball, doing five weeks and so on. But if you want to be the Michael Jordan of call email or sales, you're going to have to wake up every morning, send 800 hoops and then next day and so on and so on and keep at it for the long term. Otherwise, you're never going to be really good at it and then you're going to go nowhere. But the more you put into it on a regular basis, the better you're going to get and that's going to come back to you, you know. People who will say like, yep. hey, you know, I appreciate you following up and so on. I don't need that. But a friend of mine, we're talking about X, Y, Z. Maybe you want to have a conversation with him. And you will have like, you will be top of their mind when they're going to think about that stuff specifically. It's brilliant. Okay, I'm going to wrap things up with my final Cold Emo Golden Rule. Get back on the horse. Get back on the horse. It's a cowboy expression. And if you haven't heard it, I did. You did, of course. So yeah, this is perfect for those rejection emails that every single person who sends cold email receives. It's all about getting back on the horse and coming back at it with more information, tweaking emails, tweaking lists until you're starting to get some traction because you probably already know whether or not cold email can work for you. Uh, if you've got a hunch it can, maybe it's because a competitor has been using it or you've personally bought something off a of cold email, something tells you that it can work. And you just need to keep in mind, get back on the horse when you get knocked off. And this is going to help carry you to this level of expertise, this Michael Jordan level that Jeremy, you just described. So you got to be resilient and uh, a little bit of cowboy tough when it comes to sending cold email. You know what's funny, Jack, actually, is that I think nowadays rejection is probably not the number one problem anymore. It's more like, <laughs> hello, darkness, Crickets. my old friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. We should do a cast on that one, right? The Void. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Future cast there. <laughs> See you, Jeremy. Bye. Great cast, Jack. Okay, so you've just heard the nine golden rules of cold email. Here they are again in no particular order. Build a bridge, dangle a carrot, hold the door open, get back on the horse, make someone's day, positive persistence, what's in it for them, you catch more flies with honey, and finally, know your audience. Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. Or Stitcher or TuneIn. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks.